Dr. Bill Powell with his colleague, Dr. Chuck Maynard, who is not far here, is raising his hand, in forestry and natural resources management, and their team have been working on the disease resistance of American chestnut for many years. I truly believe that their work is the most important research done in ESF the past one or three years. American chestnut was not just one of many tree species in the eastern deciduous forest. It was the tree species, often the most abundant tree in many stands throughout the eastern U.S. I don't think there was ever a more valuable tree ecologically and economically, and I'm supposed to know that because I teach the largest, oldest dendrology course in the country here. So I'm allowed to say that. And Bill's and Chuck's encore will be the American Elm. What a career. Please read about some of Bill's accomplishments in the program. He's a professor in the Department of Environmental and Forest Biology and a Roosevelt Wildlife Station scientist in residence. Bill's talk is a great example of what the Roosevelt Wildlife Station is all about. It sounds like animals only, but it isn't actually that at all. It's the conservation of animals and plants. And Bill has a very important role in, that, in those station duties. You can read more about the Roosevelt Wildlife Station in the program as well. Please also pick up a copy of the latest field notes, which looks like this. There's a butterfly on the front taken on the, the waste beds on Onondaga Lake on the seaside gold rod. After Bill's presentation, he'll answer some questions. If there's time before the reception begins, we invite you after the talk. We have it's all kinds of food behind that barrier there. So with that, Bill, we'll give his talk. Thank you, Don. Thank you. Where there be mountains, there be chestnuts. That's the early European explorers, how they describe the Appalachian Mountains. And it's true because the uh, Appalachians, as Don mentioned, made, were made up mainly of chestnuts. About 25% of the large standing timber was American chestnut. Now, if you were to walk into those same stands today, you would see quite a different story, right? You would not see all those chestnut trees. So what I hope to do today is to describe to you why the American chestnut is so important, what happened to the American chestnut, what are we doing to try to bring back the American chestnut, and where do we go from here? Okay, so let's start off with why the American chestnut was so important. Well, the American chestnut tr was a truly keystone species in the forest, meaning that there was a lot of uh, different organisms that were reliant on the American chestnut. It produced a very stable, what's called a mass crop or a nut crop, and this nut crop was much more stable than other trees that have since replaced it in that it was a very nutritious crop and it was very consistent from year to year. Oaks that have um, replaced chestnut have a very inconsistent nut crop. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. And that, you know, plays havoc with wildlife that's trying to fatten up for the winter. Now, you might be thinking a nut crop, well, that's good for squirrels, right? Well, it absolutely was good for squirrels. But actually, there was a lot of different species that depended on American chestnut. Anything from uh, raccoons, the bears, to deer, to uh, wild turkeys, to blue jays, all these fattened up for the winter on American chestnut because it was so abundant. Even some species that are not around today, such as the Carolina parakeet, it's, it's extinct, but at one time it re re relied on the American chestnut. Possibly even the pasture pigeon, those uh, flocks that blacken the skies. They uh, roosted on American chestnut trees and fed on them in the fall. Now, American chestnut is not only important because of its nuts, but the whole tree is important. A lot of things eat the trees. Uh, for example, the leaves. Uh, this is a study done by Vern Sweeney that just recently visited me. And he told me about how the American chestnut was a preferred leaf for a lot of aquatic insects. insects. And you can see it up here, American chestnut. It was a preferred leaf, and also the insects grew much better on this particular leaf, um, as opposed to a lot of the oaks that have replaced it. So it was generally important all around to the ecosystem. Now, the American chestnut also had a significant economic value. And 
And one of the first places, of course, with the nuts is in agriculture. And you're probably familiar with roasted chestnuts because this is getting close to um, Thanksgiving time and we're getting into the holiday season. You've probably heard of roasted chestnuts. But you might not know that chestnuts could be used for many different purposes. It could be ground to a flour and used for baking. People make candies out of them. Um, you can even make beer. And by the way, it's a gluten-free beer, which is important to me because I can eat gluten. Um, by the way, um, we're going to be hosting the uh, Chestnut, uh, the American Chestnut Foundation meeting in the next couple of days. And one of the things we're going to be doing is serving some beer and some chestnut ice cream and other types of foods. Now, another economic value was the wood itself. The American Chestnut wood was very straight grained and was very rot resistant. It would often be used for um, outdoor purposes. Uh, for example, what I usually tell people is that if chestnut was abundant today as it was 100 years ago or more, everybody would be making their decks out of chestnut and you wouldn't have to pressure treat it. Um, it was used for anything from making uh, fence posts to furniture. Uh, my grandfather, who uh, was an antique dealer, he used to tell me that you don't find chestnut usually on the outside of these pieces of furniture. What you usually find it is on in the inside. Um, the outside was reserved for harder woods like uh, cherry or walnut or whatever. But the inside, the insides of those drawers would be made out of chestnut because it's so easy to, uh, to work. Chestnut has a lot of historic uses. Um, the Native Americans, some of the early uh, settlers and stuff, often used chestnut as a, for medicinal purposes. Um, this is actually a um, box where people were selling chestnut leaves in a drugstore. And it was used to relieve things like cough and breathing pro problems, arthritis, and things like that. It was also used uh, because of the high tannin content to support the leather industry uh, a number of years ago. Now, the American chestnut is really part of our heritage. Okay, you can't go to almost any city in the United States without finding a Chestnut Street, just like you'd find it at Elm Street or a Maple Street or a Walnut Street. Yes. Um, I particularly like this corner, you know, because it's the intersection of Chestnut and Powell. Um, this is actually kind of interesting because this was actually taken by one of my high school students who, who went to a science fair, and this was taken out in uh, San Francisco. Okay, I'm sorry, Los Angeles, I think it was. And so even out there, way outside the Chestnut Range, people still were naming their streets Chestnut, okay, because Chestnut was so ingrained in our heritage. Now, you're probably familiar with this song. Chestnuts roasting on open fire. So it's been kind of put into our musical background, too. Look at the date here when this was written, 1946. At that time, over half the chestnut trees were already dead for the chestnut blight. Yet people still wrote about the American chestnut. Now, sometimes the heritage of American chestnut is kind of hidden. Have anybody here been to Long Branch Park around on that, uh, North Onondaga Lake? Okay. Well, you might have seen this sign there. This sign describes uh, Palm Branch Park and where the name came from. It was named for its famed chestnut trees. Okay? So even though um, they don't call it Chestnut Park, it was still named because of the chestnut trees that were there. And wouldn't it be great to return the chestnuts to Long Branch Park? Okay, so the chestnut tree was really one of the giant trees of the eastern forest. And this is a classic picture of a timber type American chestnut tree. This is from the Forest History Society, and you've probably seen this picture before. This is of the lumberjacks standing among some very large chestnut trees. This is what we eventually want to get back to. Okay? Now, this is the, the typical timber type that you see in a forest, but if you were to grow these trees out in the open, they do spread more. And this is not a photograph, obviously. This is a painting. So it's a picture of a painting. But again, it gives you a sense of the size of these trees. Could you look at that guy up there? <laughs> He's up there knocking down chestnuts to the people below so they can collect them. Okay, so these could get to be very, very large trees. Now, we can't see trees like this anymore. There are a few straggling, surviving large American chestnut trees, mainly from people who um, early, you know, over 100 years ago moved west and they planted chestnut trees uh, when they moved. And um, Alan Hart, did I just lose my mic? Okay, I'm okay. Alan Hart is a, um, a naturalist, a photographer, and he actually went out and looked for some of these large chestnut trees, and he found some, like this one here. This is up in uh, Michigan, and this was a recently take, picture taken by Larry Brewer, 
And you can see this tree is about has a four foot diameter uh, breast height. And it's at least twice as tall as that two-story building. So these things, again, are big trees. Now, this is a rare tree. Unfortunately, it's not there anymore. Because the people didn't realize what they had, and they cut it down for firewood. Okay. So, you know, there's not that many large trees out there. There are a few, but we need to preserve those if we possibly can. Okay. Now, I just told you that American chestnut tree typically grew in this timber straight fashion. Well, they actually were, there was some diversity there. And sometimes you can get chestnut trees that actually grow quite differently, such as this one here, another picture by Alan Hart. And uh, this actually looks more like a live oak, or it's really spreading and all. So there was actually a diversity, a genetic diversity out there with uh, American chestnut. Okay, so why don't we have chestnut today? We don't have it because of a blight caused by a fungus called Cryphonectria parasitic. <laughs> And that fungus is shown here, grown on a plate. And uh, this was grown by Andy Newhouse. Uh, obviously, he's good at growing happy fungi. <laughs> so, but what this fungus will do is to um, enter a wound in the plant, uh, such as where this uh, stem scar is here. And it will colonize the wound and eventually grow out and, and infect the whole tree, or <coughs> the branch of the tree. And I have a... Um, a little video here I want you to watch. This is uh, hopefully you can be able to see okay. Um, this is a time lapse photographer, time lapse film of uh, the growth of a canker. What we did was made a small wound here. We put in some of the fungus. Um, it's already starting to colonize. You see that little indentation there. And we're going to watch it as it grows. Let's go quickly here. Okay. So this is over like a two month period. And if you watch the edges up here, you can see it breaking through and it's continuing to grow and of course it's doing it all the way around there. If you see this split here kind of expanding, that's just the tree growing. And because all the tissue in here is dead, it's basically pulling it apart as the tree is expanding. Okay. So that's about one month's growth. I'm going to uh, show you that again. I'm going to do this so you can maybe see a little bit better if I black out all the flashing around you. But what's happening in here is the fungus is producing uh, what's called mycelial fans, which are like mechanical wedges that help it pry into healthy tissue. And it's producing oxalic acid. Remember oxalic acid here? Oxalic acid is an acid that will inhibit lignification, which is the way the tree will try to stop the spread of the canker. And it also kills the uh, tissues in the chestnut. So let's just look at this one more time. And hopefully you can see it okay. But you can see all of a sudden breaking out there, there's a mycelial fan breaking out. Um, the tree is trying to wall this thing off. It's trying to stop the spread. But it can't do that because of these mycelial fans and oxalic acid. And it, this will continue to grow until it eventually girdles the tree. And it'll kill everything above that spot. By the way, I think this is the first time anybody did time-lapse photography on a camera. Um, so, what do, we ha what do we have here then? We have a canker. It kills everything above the tree. Uh, anything below the canker, though, will still survive. Right? And, um, let's see. When this first struck the United States, people started panicking. Okay? Here are some of the headlines when it first showed up in New York. All chestnut trees here are doomed, blight extending all over this country, and not one may be left standing. They really predicted what was going to happen. Chestnut trees <laughs> face destruction. Trees worth millions dying in uh, the state, New York State, and cankers for which there is no remedy. Okay? So, people were panicking. New York is um, significant here because that's actually where chestnut blight started. And um, Cindy Agonistakis of the Connecticut Experiment Station did some really nice historical work. And she found out that as far back as 1876, people were starting to bring in Japanese chestnuts so people could plant them in their yard. These are more like little orchard trees that you can get chestnuts off of. But when they brought those over, they didn't realize at the time they were bringing over a hitchhiker, the um, chestnut blight. And the chestnut blight does not hurt, or does not kill anyway these Asian chestnut trees, because they co-evolved together. But the American chestnut never had a, 
had never been exposed to the blight, so it was very, very susceptible. The actual start of chestnut blight officially is 1904, because that's when it was first described by uh, Dr. Merkel, who was a botanist at the uh, New York Botanical Garden, and he found it on trees at uh, the Bronx Zoo. Okay, I love this picture here. This is a picture that was just published in um, the Journal of the American Chestnut Foundation. And what it's showing is a forest of chestnut trees down at Shenandoah National Park. And we know these are chestnut trees because if you see all this white area up here, all that in there, those are catkins. Those are the male flowers of the American chestnut. So you can see how abundant it was in this forest. You can see how large these trees were compared to those houses in the foreground. So this is a very abundant tree. This was taken during the, uh, probably in June of 1912. Now what's happening in New York? Well, this is what's happening in New York at that same year. Trees were dying. Um, this is a photograph along the Long Island Railroad. And as it mentions here, uh, note the healthy condition of trees of other species. Okay, so this is during the summer. These are healthy trees here. Those are dead chestnuts. The largest trees in the forest are dying. And people were seeing this mile after mile as they traveled down this road. Okay, can you imagine that happening today? Well, we really don't have anything like that today. Probably some of the closest things we have is something like this. Uh, this is uh, hemlocks dying, dying from uh, hemlock woolly adelgia. Uh, this is down in North Carolina uh, from along the Blue Ridge Parkway. And all these great trees here are basically dead hemlocks or some live ones up here. Now, this looks pretty bad, but if you think about the American chestnut, you can probably double the number of dead trees in that scene when the blight came through with American chestnut. Okay. So, so the uh, blight started in New York State, quickly spread throughout the range of American chestnut, and by 1950 had killed somewhere between 3 and 5 billion large American chestnut trees. Why? So that 1950, that's a while ago. That's over 60 years ago. Why um, isn't the chestnut extinct? Right? Well, it's because of two things. One is that the chestnut blight -like fungus cannot compete with the microorganisms in the soil. And therefore, it cannot attack the roots. In fact, if a root comes out of the soil, that root can get a canker on it. But as long as it's in the soil, it, it's protected. And in fact, people have actually taken mud or soil and done a mud pack on cankers and then it'll cure those cankers. So those microorganisms are very, very protective. So the other thing about chestnut though is it can sprout from the root collar. So you have these new sprouts coming up and all the energy that's stored down the roots can send these up very quickly. For example here, this is a, a, a chestnut tree we cut um, in the fall of last year. It sprouted again in the spring and in one season, grew over seven feet tall, actually seven foot three inches in height. So that's basically how the chestnut is surviving today. It's surviving at the roots. And there's still millions of chestnuts out there, and which is great because if you want to do a restoration program, you need that genetic diversity, and it's still out there if you can capture it. So the chestnuts right now are stuck in this Sisyphus-like cycle, though. They are um, surviving at the roots. They send up shoots. That shoot will get blight, it will get killed back down to the ground, it will send up a new shoot, it will get blight, and get killed back down to the ground. Now, um, eventually, those uh, roots could run out of energy and the tree will not continue to uh, re-sprout. Another thing, down south, there's another disease that's actually very serious called Phytophthora root rot. Now, that's very deadly for chestnut because not only does it kill the top of the tree, but it kills the roots, and they will not come back from that particular disease. And we are also going to be looking at that disease. Okay, so chestnuts were very important. We lost them because of the blight. And people have been trying for a long time to figure out how do we bring these chestnut trees back? How do we control the blight? And there's been a lot of failure along the way. But there's basically two programs right now that are showing some signs of success. There's a breeding program and there's our transgenic program. And I'm going to talk about both of those. The breeding program, the way this works, is the way most people um, envision the way we uh, produce new plants, the plants that are in your grocery store. What they do is they'll cross two different species, two closely related species of plants, and make a hybrid. In this case, it's uh, Chinese and American chestnut. 
Castania melissima and Castania dentata. Now that hybrid will have all the genes from each of these two species. The idea here is that you want to transfer over the genes from the Chinese chestnut that confer resistance. And there's actually many of them. Um, Ch Chinese chestnut has what's called quantitative resistance. So it takes a lot of genes to make it resistant. So you want to transfer those over, and then you're going to go through a series of what's called back crosses. This is where you cross these trees back to pure American trees, and the object here is to get rid of all the Chinese traits you don't want, because there's a lot of them. Things like um, they're not as cold tolerant, they're very short, they're very branchy, and such as that. Um, so you want to get rid of those while maintaining the resistance genes. Now, part of the problem with this program is that you have to get the genes in what's called a homozygous state. That means you have to have two copies of each of the genes to be fully functional. Um, so you have to, at the very end, do what's called a intercross to get those trees. So the goal here is to get a tree that's 1 16th Chinese and the rest American, but in that 1 16th you have the three or more resistance genes. Okay? And they've actually had some success. They've produced trees that are more resistant than the American chestnut. They haven't quite got to the point where they're as resistant as the Chinese that they started with yet, but they're working toward that. Okay, now I want to compare that program, which is kind of a traditional program, to the transgenic program, which is a genetic engineering program. Um, to do that, I want to first say that both are very viable options. Um, now, to do this comparison, we've got to think about how many genes are in chestnut. And we know from the Forest Health Initiative sequencing project, there's around 45,000 genes in chestnut. So, if you want to make a tree that's 1 16th Chinese, what you have to make sure is that of those 1 16th, you don't have the traits that you don't want, but do have the traits you do want from the Chinese chestnut. Now, let me give you an illustration here. And I like to use this illustration um, of where the genes represent, are represented by words in a book. Okay? So let's say you have a typical book of 45,000 words. That would be about around 190 pages. And you say, you want to say that's 1 16th Chinese. That means, means 11 pages or 2,812 words are in Chinese. Okay. Is that important? Maybe, maybe not. Depending on where those words are located. Is it in the critical prop, plot line? Maybe you wouldn't be able to understand it. So what they have to do is make sure that those words are not important. All right. Now, let's look, let's look at uh, what we do in the transgenic program. Still using the book um, example, I'm going to put one little passage out from that. This says, it was very exciting at the, that season to roam the boundless, the then boundless chestnut woods of Lincoln. This is from Henry Thoreau. Um, what we are actually doing, instead of making a big change like that, we're making a very small change. We're only adding two to four words to this book. Okay? So the book is pretty much the same. Okay? We're not making a new species or anything like that. It's the same book. We're just adding a few words to it. And those words are, I am resistant. Okay? So um, that's what we're doing. That's an advantage with our program. We don't have to then try to get rid of a bunch of genes we don't want. We just put in the genes we do want, and we go from there. We also don't have to do an F2, meaning we don't have to do the inner cross at the very end, because we are looking for dominant type of genes. All right. Now, there is a disadvantage for doing transgenics. And this disadvantage is more of a perceived disadvantage. One of the things that we want to make sure is that we don't make a tree that's going to be harmful to the environment. And I definitely don't want to make a tree that's harmful to the environment. I don't want anything sinister. I kind of like this picture here. It's a sinister tree. This, we saw this when we were hiking in, in North Carolina also. I call this a dragon tree. This kind of looks like a dragon. Okay, so we are highly regulated. We are regulated by the USDA, the FDA, and the EPA. So before we can actually pass out these trees to the general public, we have to get approval from these three agencies. Now, we have to do that. The breeding program does not. So that's an advantage they have. Matter of fact, um, there's been some old programs to try to make resistant trees where they did what's called radiation breeding, where you treat nuts with gamma radiation, you produce random mutations, you plant those out, those aren't regulated either. 
So all those things they can just plant out all they want. But ours are very highly regulated, even though we know exactly what we're putting in. Now the problem with that is that, of course, this adds you know, from three to five years to the development. And along with that is the cost of the extra work that you have to do. So that's a disadvantage for us. But in a way, it's, a good, it's an advantage too, because when we put the trees out, you know that they've been basically approved by these agencies. All right, so let's talk about how do we actually make a transgenic tree? How do you get the genes in? Well, um, Chuck and I have been working on this now for 23 years. And you can see that we look quite different. I got a lot more gray hair. Uh, Chuck has a lot less hair. <laughs> um, but I do want to mention that this is not just the Chuck and Bill show, as it's often people uh, call it. Uh, we've actually had over 60 researchers that contributed directly to this um, program. They can be anywhere from high school students to undergraduates to graduate students to uh, postdocs to uh, technicians to visiting scientists. Over the years, we've, we've had a lot, a lot of help over this uh, time. Our current um, group is uh, listed here, Linda McGuigan, and sorry for the G, um, Andy Newhouse, Catherine Baer, Allison Oakes, Kristen Stewart, and Dale Warner. And I think they're in the audience here today, so during the um, uh, break time, if you want to talk to them about the project, feel free to do that. Okay, so how do we get a gene into the American chestnut tree? Well, basically we use a, a natural genetic engineer, and that is a bacterium called Agrobacterium tumefaciens. This bacteria is just a normal bacteria, lives in the soil, and it has evolved this mechanism where it can actually put a gene into a plant. It's been doing that long before we ever thought about doing it. Okay? And the reason why it does that is because it will put a gene into the plant to make the plant make a food that only it can eat. Right? So, what have scientists done? Well, they discovered this bacteria and then they tamed it. So that now, instead of putting the gene it wants to put in, it puts it in the gene we want it to put in. Okay? So we actually put the genes in the bacteria, it puts it into the plant for us. Now the trick here is that it will put the gene into one cell at a time. All right? And therefore, we must be able to regenerate a whole tree from a single cell in order for that gene to be in all the cells of the tree. Okay? That's not an easy thing. And um, this next section, this was done in Dr. Maynard's lab uh, by many people um, that contributed to it. And he did a great job here. Um, and the, what, what I titled this is how to make a tree from seed the hard way. Okay? Basically, what you have to do is you have to get the right kind of tissues that you can regenerate a whole plant. And for chestnut, the only tissue that will do that is embryo tissue. Okay? You can't do it from leaves like you do with poplar or other plants. You have to actually go and get the embryos. And there's only like a two-week window when the fertilized nuts are just at the right stage. You can get those embryos to replicate in a petri dish. So those are collected. They are sterilized. They are cut open under a dissecting microscope. Here are the embryos. You take those out, you put them on a special media, and what you're hoping to do is to have those things replicate so you can start using them in a transformation. Now, this is a, a pretty a significant process. Only about one in a thousand of these embryos you isolate actually turn into an embryo culture. Okay, so it's a lot of work. But once you have an embryo culture, which is shown right here, that could be maintained for many, many years. And what's happening here is basically these little embryos, this is called somatic embryos, they keep budding off and forming new embryos. And they all originate from a single cell. Okay? So they can be maintained for a long time. So we take this tissue and actually put the genes in using agrobacterium. So we do agrobacterium media transformation. Um, the first time we did this, it took a long time. From the transformation step to where you have to have a plant in a pot, took uh, over two years. Okay, and the first person who did that was Linda McWigan through the whole process. Um, since that time, our, our team has been able to cut that down to 18 months and just recently has cut it down to 12 months or less. Okay? And one of the things that's really helped us is using what's called a bioreactor. This allows us to select the uh, transformed embryos much quicker. Okay, so now you have transformed embryos. How do you get a tree? Well, you have to go through several different medias that tie, kind of mimic what's going on inside of a nut when the seed is germinating. And these uh, embryos will go through several different stages, such as the hard stage, torpedo, early cotyledon. Then it goes through this, what we call the ugly stage. <laughs> it's pretty ugly. And then from these uh, ugly stage, you get some shoots. And all of a sudden, it starts 
at this part, it starts actually looking like a plant again. Okay. Now once you get shoots, you can actually multiply those shoots up just by cutting them and growing more shoots. And so you can get actually a whole forest of plants from one shoot eventually and make lots and lots of trees. But you notice here, there's no roots here. The leaves are very small. They don't have any cuticle or anything. So you have to go through some other processes. You have to get roots on the bottom, which takes several steps. And once you get roots on the bottom, you have what's called a plantlet. Now this plantlet is not ready quite yet to go out in the field. Um, you have to do what's called acclimatization. So it can get a cuticle layer on the leaves. The roots can form the fine, fine structures. And it can get used to photosynthesizing. Okay. So we go through this acclimatization. We go into this very high, high humidity growth chamber. And then slowly decrease the humidity and increase the light to the plants can go out in the greenhouse. And they get to a certain size and they go out in the field. Okay. Our very first transgenic trees were actually planted way back in 2006. We only planted two at that time. But each year we've gotten better and better at this and now we have well over a thousand trees, uh, transgenic trees in the field that we are now testing. Okay. Now there's something else you need to know before I give you the great results that I'll come up in just a minute. And that is you have to know what an event is. And it's not like this thing tonight. This is an event, but it's not what we're talking about here. Um, an event, basically, is the way we describe um, a cell line of, that comes from transformation. Okay? And the best way for me to describe that is to actually show you in a picture here. This is an embryo cluster about two weeks after we exposed it to the agrobacterium. And it's put a gene in here. This is a gene for the green fluorescent protein. And what you have here is this, this light green background is this background fluorescence that we normally would see. The brighter green is the fluorescence from this particular gene that we put in, or gene product. Now, uh, at this stage, you're pretty much individual cells. Uh, and so, let's say that dot right there will re represent event number one. Okay? But this one might event, be represent event number two. Those are separate events. But any plants, if we, we can produce a force from that event, and they'll be all clone of one each other, but they're going to be different than this event down here. Okay? Why are they different? Well, it's because of where the gene goes in. When you use agrobacterium and transform a cell, put a gene in, it goes in in what's called a semi-random fashion. There are some places it prefers, but it will go fairly random into the genome. And depending where it goes will influence the way it acts. Right? So let's say these are the 12 chromosomes in uh, chestnut. Well, maybe in one of those cells that, that fluoresced there, it went into that chromosome. Right? Everything that grew the chromosome that cell, it would always be in that spot in the chromosome from there on. But that other cell, maybe it went in over there. Now everything from there will grow with the, the gene in that particular spot. Sometimes it will go into multiple spots. But again, anything that grows from that cell will always be there. That's what we call an event. Right? Now, why is this important? Because depending where it goes, it will influence the way it is expressed, how it's produced a product. Okay? This is called position effect. Now, the best way to think about this is in real estate. Um, think about location, location, location. Let's say you build a house here in Syracuse, and it costs $150,000. If you use the exact same floor plan, the same materials, everything, built it out in San Francisco, it's going to be worth a lot more all because it's in a different location. Same thing with genes. It goes, if it goes in different locations in the genome, it can give you a different outcome. And that's a good thing. Um, this is an example of a transformation experiment. Um, what we have here is looking at a gene called lactase gene. This is actually a gene from Chinese chestnut. And we're interested in it because this American chestnut here only produces a certain level, but these two Chinese produce a lot more of the genes. So we're thinking that this might be involved in resistance. Okay, these are all our transgenic events. So these are called the Travis events, named after Dale Travis. Um, and um, we are looking at them to see if any of these will confer resistance. Well, one thing we know is that they have different expression levels. And the great thing about that is you can pick one over here to test that has higher than chestnut uh, expression level. You can have some that are similar to chestnut or Chinese chestnut expression levels, and some that are more like American. And you can test all those things differently. Pick the best one. And So, what genes are we testing? I just showed you um, one gene is, is the uh, lactase gene, but we have lots and lots of genes we're testing. We're testing 
21 genes from Castanea melissima, which is one type of Chinese chestnut, six from Castanea ciguinii, uh, another uh, Chinese chestnut, and six genes that come from other plants. All right, some of these genes we actually went to China to get samples to get, to get those genes. Okay, the one I'm gonna focus on right now though, because I don't have all, all night to talk, is the oxalate oxidase, ox, oxalate oxidase gene from wheat. And the reason why this gene is very interesting is because of what it does. It actually detoxifies oxalic acid. Okay. Remember oxalic acid? Oxal oxalic acid is um, the acid that kills the tree that the fungus produces. Okay. So we like this. One thing is it's, it's made in wheat. So you know, people eat this all the time. So when you go and get your snacks back there, you're going to be eating this particular gene and gene product. So it's, it's a safe gene. And it targets the weapon that the fungus is using to attack the tree. So we really like this. In fact, when I first um, found out about this gene back in the 1990s, early 1990s, I thought this was the perfect gene for chestnut. And uh, it took us a long time before we could actually test it because we were still developing the transformation methods. We did test it actually in hybrid poplar and it worked in hybrid poplar too. Okay, so how do we test a gene? Um, for blight resistance. Well, the traditional way is to take a tree, grow it to be about three or four years old, um, make a wound on it, put a little bit of the uh, fungus mycelium on the, that wound, and allow it to form a canker and measure its growth. Well, we don't want to wait four years for every one of these events that we make. So we have developed a method that's a surrogate for this type of infection. And it helps us to predict if we have resistance. And what we use is leaves. Now, chestnut blight does not normally affect the leaves, but if you were to infect this mid vein back here with the fungus, it will um, grow and form a necrotic spot, and the size of that necrotic spot is correlated to how resistant the tree is. Okay? And the great thing about this, and this was uh, optimized by Andy, he's in here today, um, is that it will allow us to test in somewhere between three and seven days, which takes months out here to test. And we can also test trees that are only less than a year old. Okay? So that saves us a lot, a lot of time. All right? So we know this works because we did a, on a lot of tests outside the transgenics. Um, Andy had looked at this and he found out that, yeah, American chestnut in blue here, you get very big brown spots large areas of necrosis. For uh, the resistant Chinese, you get these small areas of necrosis. For an intermediate, in this case, chinkapin, which we know is intermediate level resistance, you get an intermediate size spot. Okay, so it's a very nice, nice assay. It's a picture of it down here. All right, now, what you're gonna look at here is the Darling Four tree. This is one event that we work with that has the oxide oxidase gene. And this is the very first tree that we show to have enhanced blight resistance, right there. And if you look at this, this is a leaf assay. Here's the American making a big uh, brown spot. Here's the Chinese making a smaller one. This is in between. So we think this has intermediate levels of blight resistance. Matter of fact, these are the trees that have been planted out in front of our library and the ones found planted outside the gateway building. So these have intermediate levels of resistance. Now, if any of you have seen my TED talk, I showed some actual stem inoculations on those trees uh, from uh, 2012. And what we saw in 2012 was here's a canker growing on a uh, controlled American chestnut tree, or a, a group of them actually. Now here's Chinese chestnut, and there's the Darling Four, and it tracks along with the Chinese chestnut. That was looking actually better than what the leaf assays were predicting. This year, we have to repeat it, because everything in science has to be repeated. Um, and we're getting the same kind of pattern. Um, the uh, Darling Four actually grew about the same size as it did last year, but the uh, American control and the Chinese controls were a little bit smaller. And we think that was probably because of this was such a wonderful growing year um, for trees, and the trees were just super healthy, you know. So they tend to be a bit smaller, uh, the tankers and stuff. But this, actually, this assay actually almost matches exactly what we got from the leaf assay. So this is a good thing. This shows one thing that we enhance resistance with oxalate oxidase 
and this leap as a is very predictable. Okay, this leads us to the exciting stuff. Okay, well, just a minute. One other thing I want to show some natural cankers. These are not inoculated trees. These are natural cankers. This is the Darling 4. So you do get damage on the Darling 4 trees. They're only in weak levels of resistance. And very small stems can actually be killed. But this tree right here is surviving, even though it's damaged like that. This is a similar sized tree of American that's actually dying at the top with a diddly canker on it. Okay, so that's the difference between these two. Okay, so this is the exciting stuff right here. All right? <laughs> these are some of our newest events. Okay? Um, this is, again, the leaf assay. Here's American with a nice big brown spot on it, necrosis. Here's Chinese with a typical smaller. Look at these. Okay? This Darling 311, Darling 11 are even smaller in the, in the necrotic size than the uh, Chinese chestnut. Okay? Now, we still need to test this in the stem assay. But so far, these leaf assays have been very predictive. Okay, um, so and here compare these to the Darling Four from before. Now these trees are still small; they're just starting to peek out of our 18-inch uh, tree tubes. So it's going to be not next summer, but the following summer that we can actually do a traditional type of stem assay. But we think they're going to be showing very high levels of resistance. We still have tested though. Okay. Now, we have also uh, are testing lots of different genes, lots of different events, and this is kind of a compilation of a lot of those leaf assays, just to kind of show you what kind of results we're having. What we, we're showing is a little bit different than that last graph in that we normalized all the um, the process areas for the American chestnut, that blue line right there. So we're looking for things that are lower than that. <coughs> things that are higher are no good, and actually we get a lot of events that are not any good. Those are get those will get thrown away. Okay. Now here, these are those new darling events, all lower than the, these red ones are the Chinese chestnut. So these are all lower than even the Chinese chestnut. Okay. So we have six of those so far. Uh, here's the darling four intermediate. We have lots of them. They're intermediate. Darling three is the intermediate. Um, one of the things I want to point out here, here's that black case gene that I talked about before, the ones for the Travis line. And that one's actually showing a uh, intermediate level of resistance. Let me follow it up here. Okay, it's the 20 right there. Okay, so what this shows is that this is a gene from actually Chinese chestnut. This could be one of the genes that Chinese chestnut actually uses to be resistant. But it's not giving you full resistance because, again, Chinese chestnut uses quantitative resistance, and you have to add on lots of genes to be full. But that helps us to identify those genes. These genes now can be stacked with the oxidase-oxidase gene and make an even better tree. Here's another one that looks pretty good. It gives us intermediate resistance from Chinese chestnut, a proline-rich gene. These are the Mansfield lines. So we're starting to identify more genes that can enhance blight resistance. Right? Now, what are we going to do once we have a resistant tree and we've gone through the regulatory process? Well, we don't want to put out just the tree that comes out of the lab, because that is basically a clone, okay? And you don't want to put out a monoculture. You want to put out a diverse group of trees. So we're starting to outcross these trees to uh, mother trees that are being maintained for us by the American Chestnut Foundation. And the idea here is to take those offspring and then to further outcross them. And every time you outcross them, you're increasing the genetic diversity of the trees that will eventually go back into the wild, okay? So um, you keep doing this on and on. Right here, we've gone this far already. And um, we not only want to cross with the mother trees, but we'd like to start crossing actually with some of the large surviving chestnut trees in the field. And there are some out there. This is a tree that's out at Manlius. has an 18-inch diameter. It's a very nice large chestnut tree. But fortunately, about two-thirds of the way up, it has a canker on it. So it's on its way out. Now, to do these crosses, we need to get pollen from our transgenic trees. And typically, it takes three to seven years for a chestnut tree to start producing pollen. That's too long for us. We don't want to wait that long. So we have developed a method. And it's kind of serendipitous that we've discovered this. But uh, we developed a method that if you put these uh, little plantlets or seedlings in a high light growth chamber, you can actually get pollen in less than a year from them. Okay? And now you can take this pollen, take it out to the field, 
and cross it with surviving American chestnut trees. Right? And we've actually done this. And we've uh, um, pollinated some trees. We've gotten nuts from these, and these nuts are transgenic. They can carry, carry the gene. And we know that these ger nuts germinate. And I'm just going to show you this little film of the nuts germinating. This is a time-lapse photography. And I want to show you this because, you know, most people think plants are pretty, pretty boring because they just sit there. But actually, plants do move. You just can't see it because they move so slowly. So here's uh, the uh, dance of the chestnuts. Watch that. Okay. So these trees actually are not being blown by the wind. They're actually moving on the road. <laughs> and they can actually start dancing. Some of them get pretty wild. Alright, to conclude, I want to 
um, give you a vision I have. Now, what I'd like to see is our university become known for chestnut, or not only for chestnut restoration, but for tree restoration in general. Um, American Chestnut obviously is the flagship project, but we don't want to be a one-hit wonder here, right? Um, so, as actually Don mentioned, we are already starting to expand out to look at other trees that need help. And one of those is the American Elm. We've actually done some good preliminary stuff with that. We've actually developed a transformation system. We've tried out one gene, but we have all these other genes now that come from chestnut that we can try in American Elm. Now, there's a lot of other problems out there with trees, and we could possibly address those, such as maybe we want to start working with ash. Um, question mark, we could. Um, we might want to work with the uh, hemlock or maybe the walnut. All these things have been attacked by um, devastating diseases that could benefit from the biotechnology approach. And with the things that we've learned with American chestnut, we might be able to apply those to those other areas eventually. We might even want to apply it to the oaks and protect Oki, our favorite mascot here at ESF, um, maybe from sudden oak death. Um, so what we have here with the chestnut is an opportunity not only to save the chestnut, but to save other tree species that need uh, help. Okay? So I'm going to stop there and allow you to ask me questions. And what I'm going to leave you here with is this passage. To, so while people are asking me questions, you can just read this. This is, I think it's very interesting. This is by Henry Thoreau, and it talks about chestnuts. Okay? So I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Uh, white, well, let's put it this way, everything loves to eat chestnut, and, and deer is no exception. Um, you know, right now when we grow chestnuts, we have to grow them in, in fenced areas where we have deer fences to keep them protected. Some people use tree tubes, but there's a lot of problems with tree tubes in itself. Um, you know, I don't know, I think you'd have to talk to a forester, because that starts going beyond my, my expertise. Chuck, do you have a, a suggestion? Uh, so that's something we're going to have to watch out for. 
Um, eventually, we want to start producing these trees as they normally would be produced in the forest. Um, just right now, we're, we're doing this, this fast method just to get some resistant trees. But eventually, we're going to put them out and, and have them outcross to wild trees and try to keep all their um, traits that, that would normally be out in the forest. I'm not sure if that answered your question or not. I'm not, I'm not sure. Well, I, I Key studies in biology, some biologists I think is, is this protein bending or the way proteins fit in space and, and that is significant in terms of understanding your behavior and your reactions. And right. Reactions. Right. But, but that's not what we're doing. We're, we're not modifying a given protein. We're adding a protein or a gene for a protein and that protein folds just like it normally would fold in the wheat and is active just like it is in the wheat. Um, so we're not changing that in any way. We are doing things like we're looking at um, metabolomics in the nuts to make sure we haven't changed any any components of the nut to say that it's the same as the wild type or any bred type tree um, when there's uh, you know, back cross breeding. Um, we're looking at insect feeding, we're looking at mycorrhizal associations to make sure we haven't changed anything like that. Um, but I, I don't think the with the protein folding, that's, that's something we have to be concerned with because the gene we're producing is the same gene that's being produced in that might not answer your question. So. <coughs> Sorry. Um, how have you examined how your process of causing the uh, trees to pollinate early, how that might affect their life history? Um, at this point, we, we can't because we're just starting to get uh, seedlings from that. So the trees that we made from this uh, uh, early pollination um, basically are, are really only less than two feet tall. Um, so we, we will be following these trees, and in fact, we have a, a grant um, on the biotechnology risk assessment where we'll look at the growth of trees along with many other things, and we'll be able to detect if something like that happens. Um, the, blood, oh, the bloods on the oak tree or the sun oak dent or the elm tree that you're talking about, how you want to um, maybe in the future help them, are they similar to the bloods that were on the chestnut tree? Okay, so the, the ones that are on in Elm, it's similar, in, uh, well, no, it's not, well, it is similar in that uh, they're both uh, fungi, okay, but the, the way they act on the tree is differently. On Elm, basically they clog up the vascular tissues and cause a wilt in the Elm, where chestnut produces a canker and basically um, chokes off the chestnut by making a canker that gives a branch. Um, in either case, though, um, if you try to do, make something that's antifungal, you should be able to stop either one. But we might have to adapt and use a, a slightly different gene for elm than we do for chestnut. Um, so we'll just have to try it out and see. Do you plan to achieve quantitative resistance in the lab or through crossbreeding in the field? Okay, so first, we're, we're, we want to have just single gene resistance at, at first. Okay, that's like with the oxide oxidase gene. Um, then we we'll probably will stack genes onto that to make sure it's durable because these trees will live for hundreds of years. We don't want the uh, fungus to mutate in some way that can overcome a single gene. But if we put multiple genes in there, the chances of it overcoming it um, decrease very significantly. Um, so that's why we're also interested in those genes that might only confer resistance part way to add to the ones that go all the way. That's Good question. So, will the fungus that invades chestnut invade another tree? Um, actually, Prytonectra parasitica, which is the fungus that causes chestnut blight, can affect other trees. Like I mentioned, the chinquapin, which is closely related to chestnut, it actually causes damage on chinquapin. Um, chestnut, or uh, Prytonectra parasitica, can survive on many different oak species, like scarlet oak. It usually doesn't kill them, but if they're under water stress or something like that, it can, can lead to death at times. And that's actually why even though most of the chestnut trees are gone, there's a reservoir of private nectar parasitica out in the wild because they survive on a lot of different oaks. They don't necessarily cause damage to them unless they're hotly stressed, but they're always producing spores from those. Yes. An excellent question, and that's one of the things that we are looking at. I had um, a uh, 
uh, Technology Risk Assessment Grant, and we worked with uh, Tom Wharton here in uh, our department and some of his students, and we were actually looking at um, uh, mycorrhizae associations in our transgenic trees and our non-transgenic trees. And um, the first ones we looked at actually had a, a vascular promoter, and we saw no difference with that. We will be looking at these particular ones that have a stronger promoter to make sure we're not affecting them. But it really shouldn't because the way this enzyme works is it basically detoxifies oxalic acid. And those mycorrhizae do not make oxalic acid, so it should not harm them. But we will be testing that, yes. Suppose this works. Okay. Have you been any concern to replace the entire eastern coast or the entire eastern forest with any particular species that is going to pick up one more? Okay, um, so the question is, you know, will chestnuts take over? And I don't think that's going to be the case. Um, one thing, it will, it will take centuries just to get back to where it was before the blight. Isn't this like reintroducing almost like a foreign species now? Well, I mean, that's, you know, our forests are, are under attack by many different um, pathogens. And I think the forests are becoming less and less diverse. So I think um, this is not um, going to be, be replacing the trees. It's actually going to increase the diversity of the forest. I don't think we're going to, it's not going to crowd out another tree and, and make it go extinct or anything like that. It's just going to become part of the chestnut oak hickory mix, you know, in, in my opinion. And it's going to take a long, long time to, to do that too. And I think it will benefit the forest. Okay. We're going to we'll stop the question so we can go to the reception, but uh, can I ask all of this team, Chuck and all the techs and all the students who have been involved, would you all please just stand up? And so if people uh, have a chance to talk with all of you, we could just stand up for just a yeah. And so that's... If, to the back where we've got all kinds of food and drink, but I, I, I forgot to do this last time. I, I want to uh, thank uh, Meredith Burrow, who has been so instrumental in all the, there's so many logistical things that <laughs> thank you very much for helping. Um, she's the executive director of the Roosevelt Wildlife Station. Michelle Stotler, is she from Michelle? I didn't see her. It's very helpful, um, this one and the last lecture. And my administrative assistant, uh, Sandra Palomino, who's somewhere in the back fussing with the flyers. Um, <laughs> so thank you all for your help. So, yes? So if anyone is going to Shop City, one of our alumnus would love to have a ride in Shop City. Yes, not, not that far from here. And if you're from the shop city area, you know where it is. So, uh, <laughs> so hook up uh, back at the uh, where the food is. So thank you very much for coming tonight. Uh, <laughs>